Hello everyone and a warm welcome to the Core and Main Q1 2022 earnings call. My name is Melissa and I'll be your operator. If you would like to ask a question following today's presentation, you can press star followed by one on your telephone keypads. I now have the pleasure of handing over to your host, Robin Bradbury, to begin. Robin, over to you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Core and Main Fiscal 2022 First Quarter Earnings Call. This is Robin Bradbury, Vice President of Investor Relations and FP&A for Core and Main. I am joined today by Steve LeClaire, our Chief Executive Officer, and Mark Witkowski, our Chief Financial Officer. Steve will lead today's call with a brief business update, followed by a review of our growth strategy and an example of how we are targeting growth in under-penetrated under product categories. Mark will then discuss our first quarter financial results and a full-year outlook, followed by a Q&A session. We will conclude the call with Steve's closing remarks. We issued our fiscal 2022 first quarter earnings release this morning and posted a presentation to the investor relations section of our website. As a reminder, our earnings press release presentation and the statements made during this call include forward-looking statements. These statements are subject to risks and uncertainties and actual results may differ materially from those ex expectations and projections. Such risks and uncertainties include the factors set forth in the earnings press release and in our filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Additionally, we, additionally, we will discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures during today's call, which we believe are useful to assess the operating results and efficiency of our business. A reconciliation of these measures can be found in our earnings press release and in the appendix of our fiscal 2022 first quarter earnings presentation. Thank you for your interest in Core in Maine. I will now turn the call over to Chief Executive Officer Steve LeClaire. Thanks, Robin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to our fiscal 2022 first quarter earnings call. Starting on page five, I'll begin with a brief business update. We delivered an extraordinary start to fiscal 2022 as we achieved strong growth in both net sales and adjusted EBITDA. This marks our 25th consecutive quarter of average daily sales growth. Growth in the quarter was driven by strong demand across each of our end markets, higher average selling prices as we passed along rising material costs, execution across our sales initiatives to drive market share gains, and acquisitions. Inflation remained elevated and supply chain challenges persisted through the first quarter, but our resilience and execution delivered remarkable results. We achieved another quarter of solid gross margin rate expansion relative to the prior year. When combined with our 52% net sales growth and cost leverage, we delivered over 101% adjusted EBITDA growth for the quarter. Market demand continues to be strong and broad-based across the country. We are encouraged by the strength in residential land and lot development, despite rising interest rates and inflationary pressures across the residential building sector. We saw non-residential construction activity accelerate through the first quarter, and municipal repair and replacement activity remained very strong. Bidding activity, backlog, and pace of orders all trended favorably through the first quarter, giving us confidence in demand through the end of the fiscal year. Product shortages persisted through the first quarter and continue to impact lead times and material costs. We continue to benefit from our size and scale by maintaining industry-leading product availability a testament to our value proposition. We are focused on maintaining the right inventory to stay efficient, while also ensuring we have access to products to support our customers and their installation schedules. We have been increasing our inventory to maintain fulfillment levels, but we are closely bid monitoring bidding and project activity to be prepared for any changes in the market. Most of the inventory we have on hand is either reserved for a job or it is a commonly used product that can be moved quickly. Our investments in inventory and supply chain strategies are generating significant returns for the business. We remained active in M&A during and subsequent to the quarter, highlighting our commitment to drive sustainable growth through acquisitions. We closed on the Dodson Engineered Products and Lock City Supply Acquisitions and signed a definitive agreement to acquire EarthSavers Erosion Control. Dodson Engineered Products is a single branch, full service distributor of water, wastewater, storm drainage, agricultural, and irrigation products based in western Colorado. Lock City is a single branch, full service distributor of water and wastewater products based in New York. 
With almost 50 years of industry experience, Lock City Supply has proven itself to be a distributor of choice in its local market. Earth Savers Erosion Control operates three branches in California and is a full service distributor of geosynthetics and erosion control materials, including straw wattles, erosion control blankets, and a broad array of geotextile products. For over a decade, Earth Savers has been a leading and preferred resource in California, Nevada, and Arizona markets and surrounding areas. We look forward to combining forces and expanding our expertise to further serve our customer base in the Western region. Each of these businesses are great examples of what we look for in acquisitions, offering an expansion into new geographies, access to new product lines, and the addition of key talent. The integrations are progressing according to plan. Employee engagement is positive and feedback from customers and suppliers has been great. Our acquisitions are performing considerably well and we're working to optimize the synergy potential from each business. We maintain a large and highly diverse acquisition pipeline which we will continue to pursue to position ourselves for sustainable growth. In addition to our focus on M&A, we also remain focused on attracting, developing, and retaining top talent in the tight labor market. Our associates are our most valuable asset and are, are essential to our success. We offer a pay-for-performance culture to attract and retain high-performing teams. This is especially important for our customer-facing and support roles within our branches. We believe that our people-first culture consistent investment in the health, well-being, and the development of our people, and competitive compensation programs result in lower turnover rates among our associates. Sales associates and branch management have the opportunity to earn competitive pay through our performance-based compensation structure. Our local business nationwide philosophy incentivizes both our sales force and our operations team to be entrepreneurial, making decisions grounded in customer-centric approach. We have a resilient business model and a leadership team with a history of navigating through various economic cycles. The diversified nature of our end markets, customer base, product offerings, and geographic footprint provides better stability for our business relative to other distributors operating on a smaller scale. The municipal, residential, and non-residential construction markets have historically operated on different cycles and benefit from varied demand drivers. Additionally, roughly 40% of our business consists of non-discretionary municipal repair and replacement activity, which has proven resilient during the previous economic downturns. We have a long and established track record of strong cash flow generation. Our working capital optimization provides both counter-seasonal and counter-cyclical stability, allowing us to invest and build working capital during periods of growth, yet remain agile in the event of an economic decline. Our variable compensation structure also allows us to quickly take costs out of the business in times of economic declines. We are sharing these characteristics because certain market uncertainty is common discussion topic right in the market right now. However, as mentioned earlier, we are very confident in the current demand environment, the resilience of our business, and in the end markets in which we operate. While our current expectation is that we may not see incremental volume from the infrastructure bill until 2023 or beyond, due to constrained supply chains and labor shortages, we believe those funds could be accessed sooner in the event of an economic downturn. Materials and labor utilized on private construction projects today could likely be redeployed and accelerate projects in the municipal water sector. On page six, we outline the levers that enable us to drive sustainable growth. Over the last several years, we've invested in people and capabilities to strengthen our ability to drive growth. As we look ahead, we see multiple avenues to continue, to continue pursuing. We have demonstrated that we can grow faster than our underlying markets and believe that our competitive advantages allow us to continue gaining share at the local level. We continue to drive organic expansion into underpenetrated geographies through new greenfield locations. We have meaningful runway to increase our share through strategic accounts, which include large private water companies and national contractors. Our size and scale position us to continue accelerating the adoption of products and technology in our industry, such as geosynthetics and erosion control solutions, smart meters, fusible HDPE technology, and a number of other developing product categories. As I mentioned earlier, acquisitions are a key component of our growth strategy, and we have a long runway to consolidate our fragmented industry. Finally, we have opportunities to continue enhancing gross margins including private label through global sourcing 
and pricing and procurement initiatives. We have an opportunity to transition ancillary spend to internally sourced products. We have a team of pricing analysts who have been able to enhance product margins using data to drive pricing decisions and by proactively updating price changes to increase visibility to our branch network. Additionally, our category management team has the opportunity to continue shifting spend to suppliers with the best pricing and payment programs to optimize gross margins. We are in the early innings of executing on many of these initiatives and see a long path of growth ahead. On page seven, we highlight an example of how we are constantly valuing opportunities to expand our addressable market and drive sustainable growth. We have recently increased our presence in the geosynthetics and erosion control market, which is large, highly fragmented, and estimated to be roughly $5 billion of our $32 billion addressable market. Geosynthetics and erosion control products are used to prevent soil erosion and stormwater runoff. Geotextiles, geogrids, erosion control blankets, and other related products come in both earth-friendly and biodegradable options. They are primarily used to reduce environmental disruption during construction. Land development tends to increase soil erosion risk, but geosynthetics and erosion control products reduce the likelihood that soil erosion will cause pollution and displace native wildlife. We estimate that our current share in this market is only 1%, but we have a long runway of organic and inorganic growth opportunities ahead. We developed a platform for growth in this market after our successful acquisition and integration of erosion resources supply in 2019 and L&M bag and supply last fall. Our recent agreement to acquire EarthSavers Erosion Control illustrates our ability to consolidate this large and fragmented market. We maintain a large pipeline of high priority geosynthetics targets and we see meaningful bolt-on opportunities ahead. In addition to growth through M&A, we have multiple avenues of organic growth to pursue in geosynthetics and erosion control as we pull these products through our national branch network and into the hands of our existing customers. We have the ability to increase our private label offerings from the fabrication capabilities brought to us in our recent acquisition of L&M Bag and Supply. Environmentally conscious regulations for stormwater runoff prevention are becoming more prevalent we are aligning our sales efforts nationwide to capitalize on that locally regulated driven demand. Our sales associates take a consultative approach using their knowledge of the local regulatory requirements and specifications to provide customer specific product and service solutions. We are deeply involved in our customers planning process and our ability to support our customers by enabling them to comply with local regulations provides us with a significant competitive advantage. We are utilizing our acquired talent and expertise, trainings, and incentives to drive cross-selling with our existing customer base. Lastly, we are benefiting from our sourcing and consolidated buying capabilities to enhance the margin profile of certain geosynthetics and erosion control product categories. Our roll-up strategy is underway. We have a highly experienced team working to expand our product portfolio and service capabilities nationwide. To wrap up my remarks, I continue to be impressed with how our team has come together to deliver these great results. Earlier this year, we talked about our focus areas for fiscal 2022, executing on our key growth strategies, deepening our competitive advantage, and building on our foundation of long-term profitable growth. We've made great progress in each of these areas and continue to position the company for success. We acknowledge the amount of uncertainty associated with inflation, rising interest rates, in the war in Ukraine, but we have not yet seen this translate into lower demand. Furthermore, we expect to continue gaining market share as we deliver high value to our customers and execute on our product, customer, and geographic expansion initiatives. We remain focused on our operating priorities and delivering a best-in-class customer experience. I will now turn the call over to our Chief Financial Officer, Mark Wachowski, to discuss our first quarter financial results and full year outlook. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Turning to page nine, I'll begin by covering our first quarter operating results. Net sales in the first quarter were nearly 1.6 billion, an increase of approximately 52% over the prior year. The increase was driven by higher average selling prices as we passed along rising material costs, strong volume growth, and acquisitions. Our sales benefited from volume growth across each of our end markets. We've continued to see strength in residential land and lot development, 
non-residential construction activity continues to accelerate and municipal repair and replacement activity has remained strong. Net sales for pipe, valves, fittings, and storm drainage products benefited from strong end market growth, acquisitions, and higher average selling prices across most product lines. Our fire protection products benefited from a strong commercial construction market and higher average selling prices. Our meter products grew at a slower pace primarily due to shortage of semiconductor chips, which are components of certain smart meter products. We've seen sequential improvement in meter volume since last quarter and expect that trend to continue for the remainder of the year. We outperformed our end markets and drove above market growth in the first quarter due to our industry-leading product availability and the execution of our product, customer, and geographic expansion initiatives. Roughly three-fourths of our net sales was due to higher average selling prices driven by our team's ability to pass along rising material costs. We continue to experience inflationary costs from our suppliers, and the conflict in Ukraine has further challenged our supply chain in recent months. Nearly two-thirds of the pig iron imported by the U.S. last year came from Russia and Ukraine, but the conflict has reduced shipments and created a global shortage of steel and iron. When coupled with rising fuel prices, we have recently experienced immediate surcharges imposed on certain product categories. Despite these challenges, our teams are navigating the inflationary environment exceptionally well, working with our customers to give advance notice of market price increases and added surcharges. Acquisitions contributed approximately five points of sales growth in the first quarter. Gross profit in the first quarter increased 64% to $421 million. Gross profit as a percentage of net sales was 26.3%, compared with 24.3% in the prior year, an improvement of approximately 200 basis points. Similar to recent quarters, our gross profit margin was positively impacted by inventory investments ahead of supplier cost increases and gross margin enhancement initiatives. We're operating in a less sensitive price environment due to industry-wide product shortages, which we benefited from due to our supportive inventory levels. We continue to make great strides across our margin initiatives, delivering sustainable gross margin rate expansion relative to the prior year. We also achieved accretive, uh, accretive synergies from recent acquisitions, which we expect to continue benefiting from moving forward. Selling general administrative expenses for the first quarter increased 34% to $206 million. SG&A as a percentage of net sales was 12.9%, compared with 14.6% in the prior year period, an improvement of approximately 170 basis points. The decrease in SG&A as a percentage of net sales was due to our ability to leverage our fixed costs. Interest expense for the first quarter was 13 million compared with 36 million in the prior year. The decrease was primarily attributable to the redemption of the 2024 and 2025 senior notes. Income tax expense for the first quarter was 30 million reflecting an effective tax rate of 18% compared with $6 million in the prior year at an effective rate of 18.2%. The effective rate for each period reflects only the portion of net income that is attributable to taxable entities. Adjusted net income increased to $127 million from $27 million in the prior year. The increase was primarily attributable to higher operating income and lower interest expense, partially offset by an increase in income taxes. In preparing adjusted net income, we exclude the effects of non-controlling interest as we evaluate and manage the business as a whole. Adjusted EBITDA grew 101% to $219 million, improving adjusted EBITDA margin by approximately 340 basis points. The increase in adjusted EBITDA margin was due to strong net sales growth, gross margin rate expansion, and leveraging our fixed cost structure on the sales and gross margin growth. On page 10, I'll now cover our cash flow and balance sheet highlights for the quarter. We had an operating cash outflow of $37 million this quarter. We generally anticipate an operating cash outflow in the first quarter, and this year was no exception, as we continue to build inventory to support demand and to ensure we have products available for our customers while navigating long lead times. The operating cash outflow for the quarter was a result of higher profitability and lower cash interest expense that was more than offset by higher operating capital to support our growth, both year-over-year year and sequentially. 
and higher cash taxes. We've historically generated the majority of our cash in the second half of the year, and we expect the same trend this year, particularly as we work to optimize our inventory levels. Our net debt at the end of the quarter was $1,545 bringing our net debt leverage down to 2.2 times, an improvement of 0.3 times since last quarter. The improvement was attributable to an increase in the adjusted EBITDA, partially offset by $57 million of borrowings under our senior ABL credit facility to fund operations, meet our working capital needs, and execute M&A. Our term loan carries interest at LIBOR plus 250 basis points on the unhedged portion of the facility. We entered into a five-year fixed interest rate hedge with a notional value of $1 billion to lock in the LIBOR rate at 74 basis points. The current cash value of the hedge stands at $76 million. At the end of the first quarter, we had $785 million in total liquidity, excluding the cash value of the hedge. We expect that our current liquidity, combined with our anticipated operating cash flow, will be sufficient in the near term to fund operations and continue pursuing our growth strategies. I'll now wrap up on page 11 with a discussion of our outlook for fiscal 2022. Despite the current macroeconomic backdrop, we have great momentum heading into the summer selling season. We expect end market demand to remain strong and the pricing environment to remain stable for the remainder of fiscal 2022. Project activity is robust, and we have not observed a slowdown in bidding activity or a rise in project cancellations. Material costs continue to climb through the first quarter due to sustained demand and little to no improvement in supply chain capacity. As a result, we now expect pricing to be higher in the second half of the year than originally anticipated. We expect residential and non-residential demand to be positive for the full year, though we expect pressure in the second half as we anniversary strong volumes in the prior year. We expect to continue benefiting from stable municipal repair and replacement activity through the remainder of the year. Overall, end market sentiment is positive, and we enter the summer construction season with a strong backlog. Taken all together, we now expect high teens net sales growth for fiscal 2022, consisting of stronger growth in the first half of the year, moderating in the second half as we annualize more difficult comparisons from both volume and pricing. Given the sustained price realization benefit from the rising material costs, we now expect gross margin rate to be roughly flat with the prior year. At the midpoint of our range, we expect to achieve SG&A leverage, and we anticipate our full year adjusted EBITDA margin will be slightly, slightly above fiscal 2021. With these factors in mind, we are raising our expectation for fiscal 2022 adjusted EBITDA to be in the range of 710 to 750 million, representing year-over-year -year growth of 18 to 24 percent. We expect to convert roughly 65 to 80 percent of our adjusted EBITDA into operating cash flow in fiscal 2022, as we work to optimize our inventory balances in the second half of the year. We typically convert 60 to 70 percent of our adjusted EBITDA into operating cash flow, with fiscal 2021 being an exception as we invested heavily in working capital to support growth and to ensure product availability for our customers. Our expectation for operating cash conversion is less than originally anticipated due to sustained price uh, supply chain challenges and our decision to continue investing in inventory ahead of supplier cost increases. To close out our prepared remarks, we are thrilled with our first quarter results. We have a resilient business model and a leadership team capable of adjusting quickly to changes in the market. We remain focused on delivering sustainable market share gains improving profitability, and generating strong operating cash flow. That concludes our prepared remarks. At this time, I'd like to turn the call over to the operator for questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, we invite you to press star followed by one on your telephone keypad. If you change your mind or if you feel that your question has already been answered, you can press star followed by two to withdraw your question. And lastly, please ensure that when going to ask your question, you ensure that you are unmuted locally. Our first question today comes from Matthew Booley of Barclays. Matthew, over to you. Hi, uh, this is Elizabeth Langan on for Matt today. Uh, congratulations on the results. 
Um, I was wondering if you could touch on, you know, could you give us an idea of where you're seeing notable strengths within your respective end markets and what's kind of driving those expectations higher? Um, and if you have seen a change, you know, in, within any of those markets, given the uncertainty in the macro? Uh, Elizabeth, Steve, so thanks for your question. You know, what we've seen through first quarter has really been robust demand across all of these end markets. Um, municipal has continued to be very strong. You know, I, I think when we look at the demand in that area, it has continued to build for the last several quarters and is continuing to build. Bill and bid activity looks very strong as well, too, in municipal. Uh, Non-residential has been strong, continues to really drive a lot of our fire protection uh, sales. And then residential, we've been watching it closely. Obviously, we're concerned about what happens with interest rates and all of the other dynamics that seem to be impacting uh, residential. But land development continues to be really, uh, really strong through the quarter and continues to be as we, uh, as we look forward. So, yeah, I would say that we just saw all three end markets really performing extremely well uh, as we got through first quarter and continue to see a lot of bid activity uh, across all of them at this point. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I was also hoping you could touch on how you're thinking about, you know, maintaining your market share gains that have been driven by your access to products. Um, and do you expect those will be sticky, or do you think that you'll see some reversion with the loosening of the supply chain? Yeah, you know, what we're seeing right now is supply chain just continues to be tight, tighter than we anticipated. Um, you know, the capacity for a lot of our manufacturers, uh, you know, they've been challenged to try and increase it in, in any type of short or medium term, um, you know, time frame. So as that continues to be tight, we continue to get preferred access to product that many of our smaller competitors aren't able to get. Uh, we continue to serve them at a high level, and I think that's been the important part, as long as we can continue to get that opportunity to serve some of these newer customers that we've gained by getting access to product, we'll continue to, uh, to support them uh, when supply chains ease. So we're hopeful that we'll be able to continue that uh, momentum even after the supply chain starts to ease at some point in the future. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, thank you. Our next question today comes from Nigel Coe of Wolf Research. Nigel, over to you. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Will Branca on for Nigel. Good morning, Will. I was uh, first wondering if you could. Good morning. I was first wondering if you could talk about the price cost contribution of the quarter and how you see it rolling through the rest of the year. Yeah, thanks, Will. Uh, thanks for the question. As you saw, you know, gross margins for the quarter were, were strong, up about uh, 200 basis points. Uh, you know, really benefiting mostly from from price cost. Uh, you know, spread. Uh, I'd say that's about you know, we'll call it 170 so basis points of that. Uh, with another 30 basis points being contributed, uh, you know, from uh, accretive acquisitions and synergies there. So, uh, you know, we continue to, to benefit both, uh, you know, with, you know, this favorable pricing environment, buying ahead of inventory, and then uh, the gross margin initiatives that we've had in place uh, and then continue to see good results there. Got it. And uh, I was also wondering if you could provide any color on how you're thinking about the seasonality of earnings this year and, and maybe any color on the second quarter setup. Yeah, yeah. well, typically, you know, what we'd see uh, going into the second quarter would be a, be a nice ramp up sequentially uh, due to volume. Uh, you know, I'd say we're also continuing to see pricing accelerate, so I would expect you know, sequential growth uh, at the top line in Q2. Uh, typically, we'd see that kind of level off uh, in Q3. And then uh, Q4, uh, typically sequentially, would be down from those Q2 and Q3 levels, uh, primarily due to, you know, the, the colder uh, regions that we have slowing down their, their construction season. So to expect, I'd say, a return to kind of normal uh, seasonality levels uh, here through the remainder of 2022. Got it. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yep. 
Thank you, Will. Our next question today comes from Joe Ritchie of Goldman Sachs. Joe, over to you. Uh, thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, congrats to the nice start to the year. Thanks. Appreciate that, Jay. I guess my uh, my uh, yeah my, my my first question is just around. Um, I don't think I, I heard you guys say it, but the, the pricing commentary. Um, what are you guys expecting for pricing uh, as part of like your your growth equation for the year? And then, and then my, my follow-on to that is, is how should we be thinking about pricing in the second half of the year? Because obviously the comps get a lot, a lot tougher. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah, on the, on the pricing, uh, I'd say within our guide, you know, we were anticipating in our, in our previous uh, range that we gave pricing in kind of the, the mid-single digit range. We've, we've increased that now to, I'd say, mid, mid-teens for the, for the full year. Uh, which, you know, as you look at the back half, assumes, I'd say, kind of low, low to mid-single-digit pricing uh, in, in the back half. So we've got it, I'd say, starting to stabilize and then potentially some of the commodities coming back uh, later in the year and, uh, you know, just trying to reflect some of the uncertainty on the commodity side uh, potentially later this year. Got it. And then, and then, Mark, I guess, what does that kind of mean for the gross margin equation then for the year? Because obviously – you know, you guys are, are forecasting um, or embedding in the guide flat gross margins, but obviously great start to the first quarter. So, so is there is, does that necessarily mean some pressure to gross margins naturally from from those dynamics? Yeah, Joe. You know, as we've talked about, you know, we do expect that we're we're benefiting from about 50 to 100 basis points of. Uh, some temporary margin uh, benefit, just given the environment we're in. Uh, nothing really changing there in terms of our, our expectation. Uh, you know, we've had now, I'd say, several quarters and kind of this, you know, 26, north of 26 percent margin. So I think that 50 to 100 kind of coming off this this run rate is, is how we're thinking about it. So the, if those prices potentially stabilize. Uh, in the remainder of the year, uh, I'd expect that temporary benefit uh, to subside, and then uh, yeah, you know, really seeing that uh, kind of back into that uh, you know level that we were at in, in the prior year uh, as we as we finish off 20. Got it. Okay. And if I could speak one more in here, Steve, uh, for you, just the. Um, you mentioned that the infra bill, um, you're not expecting to see much of a benefit from that until 2023, some of it being supply chain oriented. Just can, can you just maybe provide a little bit more color? Um, what's, what's maybe holding up some of the spending? And then also, uh, you know, is, is, there, is there a risk at all that, that, that um, it doesn't get spent or this is really truly just deferral into 2023? Yeah, it's really looking right now that some of these projects are being tabled that would utilize, uh, the, you know, these uh, the funds just simply because of the time constraints and the uh, limited availability of products. So in the municipal world, some of the larger diameter projects that are out there, you know, the, the lead time for some of these pipe, the, the pipe products and things like that can go out in some cases almost 52 weeks. So we believe uh, until that capacity starts freeing up a little bit that we're just not going to see a whole lot of these funds being applied. Now, if things do change, you know, if uh, we start seeing maybe some residential start to soften in the back half of the year, uh, I think that may be able to pull in some of this municipal demand and, and offset some of that. Uh, that's kind of how we're looking at it right now. Uh, but we're just seeing very robust uh, pipelines today for uh, for our backlog and everything in municipal, that uh, these funds are are, are just uh, n not needed at this point to continue the, the momentum that we that we've been seeing for the last several quarters. Okay, that's that's great to hear. Thank you both. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Joe. We'll now move on to our next question, which comes from the line of Jamie Cook from Credit Suisse. Jamie, over to you. Hey, good morning. Um, nice quarter. Um, I guess a couple questions. One, um, just the operating cash flow. Um, you uh, lowered your conversion rate to 65 to 85. Sorry, to 65 to 80 percent of adjusted EBITDA versus I think last quarter you were talking about 85 to 100 percent. So if you could give some color there, is it just you know inventory 
And then my second question, you know, back to pricing again, can you just, you know, talk to what you're expect or what you're seeing on pricing on PVC or other commodities and whether these moderate in the back half of the year and just pricing on non-commodities as well? Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, you know, on operating cash flow, it's it's really more of a, a factor on our growth uh, that we expect now for the full year. You know, we we're expecting, uh, you know, growth in the higher single digit. We've raised that now uh, for the full year up into the, you know, into the high teens. So uh, to support that kind of growth rate, we think the, the working capital need is, is higher. So that's what we reduced uh, our our guide for on the operating cash flow. I'd say, you know, our investments in inventory, um, you know, we expect uh, we'll maybe hold on to those a little bit longer, but, but more of it's really related to the, to the growth that we anticipate. Um, you know, on the, on the pricing side, you know, really we've continued to see accelerating pricing across the commodities through the first quarter. Uh, Non-commodities as well, we've seen price increases there. Um, I, you know, in our guide, you know, we're, we're assuming uh, those prices kind of hold, um, you know, for the non-commodities. And, you know, commodities, we do have those coming back a little bit as we get through the, uh, through the end of the year. And, again, that's primarily reflecting uh, some of the uncertainty in the macroeconomic backdrop if, if we do see some demand uh, slow down, which, which we haven't seen. But, but if we do see that, uh, we've got that kind of reflected on the pricing of those commodities. Uh, through the remainder of the year. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. We'll take our next question today from Mike Dahl of RBC Capital Markets. Mike, over to you. Morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, it's just uh, on a couple on the M and A side. I think you framed up M&A as contributing 5% to sales for the first quarter. Can you kind of give us a thought on just given what you've already closed or signed year to date, what, what's embedded in the um, full year contribution for that? Yeah, hey, Mike. Uh, yeah, fi about 5% for the quarter, uh, price similar in the second quarter. We'll start the anniversary, some of our larger acquisitions that we did last year, primarily the, the Pacific Pipe and L&M Bag and Supply. Uh, so with the, with the new ones that we've, that we've closed, uh, we've got, I'd say, in the low to mid-single digit uh, range uh, in, the, in the back half of the year. And that, that doesn't include our savers. That, that is not closed at this point. And just quickly on that, is there any parameters you can give us to think about on I know you said three branches and full service, but relative sizing of our savers. Yeah, I'd, I'd say you know we've we've provided in the past the average size branch kind of in the eight to ten million dollar range. Uh, so with three branches, you, you're probably looking some somewhere in that that area. Okay, that's helpful. And my follow-up question, sticking on M and A. You know, obviously, there's been a lot of capital markets disruption in the public markets. You're seeing rising funding costs and things like that. Um, you know, but just wondering what you're seeing in uh, in terms of M&A, whether some of this um, kind of disruption has either shaken loose some assets, is it has affecting competition for assets? You know, how how are you seeing um, incremental changes in in your M&A pipeline today? Yeah, you know, Mike, what I'd share with you is that our pipeline's been pretty robust, certainly going into the first part of this year and continues to be so. Um, you know, when we've seen this economic disruption and some of the uncertainty that's happened in the past, well, that really lends itself very well to the type of acquisition targets that, that um, we would typically be targeting in this and bring some of them to the table. So, uh, you know, we look at it as a, almost a favorable situation in, in our industry that when you start getting a lot of uncertainty along those lines, um, it, it does really help aid the addition into the pipeline of, of some different assets in that in, in that area. But you know, if you look at where we're, um, you know, the the acquisitions that we've done, they've been just really good bolt-on acquisitions, whether they've been a, a waterworks branch in uh, New York or in Colorado. You couple that with, uh, you know, the the consolidation 
we have underway in uh, the erosion control and geosynthetics. Uh, just a very robust pipeline right now of opportunities out there for us to continue to consolidate, and we think any type of economic disruption probably helps us in some regard along those lines. That's helpful. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Our next question today comes from Patrick Borman of JP Morgan. Patrick, please go ahead. Oh, hi. Good morning. Um, can you give a little more granularity on um, the, the type of pricing you expect for commodity pipe this year uh, that's embedded within that mid-teens pricing you expect for the total company and then along those lines um, in the first quarter versus the fourth quarter what you know stepped up incrementally in, in price because the price uh, you know, contribution it, it, it seems like improved a bit uh, sequentially I'm just curious is that the commodity pipe or is that the other products that you sell that's you know other than the commodity pipe any color on, on that would be helpful yeah, Patrick. Uh, first, I guess on the Q4 to Q1, we did see an acceleration of, of pricing sequentially. Um, I'd say it, uh, PVC was a was a factor there. I, I wouldn't say it's the it's rising as as, uh, as fast as some of the other uh, product lines that we've had. Uh, you know, PVCs had a had a good run. Um, so I wouldn't say that was the, the necessarily the largest contributor in terms of the the, the uh, level of the increase, but. Uh, you know, we have seen it really across, uh, you know, a lot of the other non-commodities, which have, you know, taken maybe a little bit longer to get price, uh, you know, than the commodities. So we, we have started to see a, a benefit, uh, you know, coming out of there. In terms of the, you know, the guide uh, going forward on commodity versus non-commodity, I'd say we haven't really broken it out that way, but, you know, embedded in our in our guide, you know, for the kind of full year, mid-teens pricing does assume some of those commodities come back down. I think the non-commodities we really view as uh, much much stickier uh, for the long term and, uh, you know, continue to believe there's probably even some more opportunity there with some of those products uh, as those suppliers look to try to recoup some of their costs that they've, they've incurred. So um, that's probably the, the best way to think about that right now. Okay. Um, and then on the... Um Comments you made around, um, you know, no benefits from infrastructure yet um, in in kind of uh, demand that you're seeing, um, and then subsequent comments that you know if there was moderation in um, project activity in in your other markets, you know, non-res or resi, that you could, you know, maybe see a step up in in um, ability to serve that. I'm just curious, has there been you know, demand you're seeing from a muni perspective so far that you haven't been able to serve because, like, you're just too busy with, you know, private, uh, you know, the, like the resi and the non-res stuff? Um, is that why you're making that comment? Or I'm just curious if you give more color around that comment. Yeah, more of the, more of the, the comment is really geared towards municipal um, projects that are out there where a lot of the municipalities are just holding off at this point from further uh, rehabilitation of their lines just given the challenges associated with getting access to product. You know, um, pipes, not pipes. So there's there's a lot of different diameters of pipe that have uh, different characteristics that some may be more available than others. And for some of these projects, particularly projects with larger diameter pipe, the, the lead times right now are prohibitive from a lot of these uh, municipalities from uh, really aggressively pursuing some of these projects at this point. So we are seeing some of that happen. Um, but for the most part, you know, it, it's not a, a trade-off of, you know, which end market are we serving in this more so than, you know, are we seeing some delay in some of these projects pending uh, better availability of product and, and shorter lead time so they can execute them in a more uh, consistent, predictable manner with uh, more predictable pricing. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. We'll now move on to our question from Keith Hughes of Truist. Keith, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Most of my question has been answered, but I guess you've talked about product availability uh, issues continuing. Can, can you list off the 
top couple problem child in terms of getting supply for your customers? Well, there's, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to give strong uh, specific product detail or supplier details, but I, I think when you're looking at some of the demand that's out there, particularly for some of the basics like pipe, the lead times have extended out, fittings have extended out, you know, those, those are ob obviously critical to being able to complete a lot of these projects. Uh, you get into some smaller components that may be out there in terms of uh, restraints and, and, and gaskets and things like that that can sometimes um, slow a project down. Those are, those are primarily what we're seeing, and we're trying to balance a lot of that across all of the, the country right now to fulfill uh, projects along those lines. Meters have been a big one as well, too. So we're still continuing to be uh, challenged with getting uh, access to all of the meters that we need for a lot of the uh, smart meter installations that we have, uh, you know, where they're still struggling to, to get uh, the, the proper chips and everything they need to, to produce at the quantity that we need. So those are, those are a couple of the areas, uh, Keith, that we're seeing some of those constraints still. So it's not just commodity areas you're saying in some of the more engineered products. There's there's problems there. Yeah, so correct. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, correct. Yep, yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. Our next question comes from David Manthe of Baird. David, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. And Steve, you mentioned uh, land development trends. What are the other uh, key data sets that are on your dashboard today? You know, we're watching that closely. We're obviously watching our bid activity in a lot of these areas, David. So, you know, when we're looking at whether it's a municipal bid or, um, you know, a residential land development, we're watching, you know, the, the pace at which these are happening. We're watching the execution of these projects. You know, obviously, um, you know, time to execute a lot of these projects has been prolonged in some cases given labor shortages and uh, supply constraints. So, you know, we watch a lot of those aspects to make sure that uh, projects are moving along. We've seen our backlog age a little bit as we try and fulfill um, <laughs> and execute the fulfillment through these. So those are a couple of the key things that are on, you know, my, uh, my daily and weekly uh, look that I, and how I assess what's, what's happening out there. And, you know, as, as we've gone through that, we've been able to relook at how we're looking at the rest of the year, how we're looking at pricing, and I think you've seen that reflected in the guidance that we've provided and the confidence that we have and what we're seeing in our end markets at this point. Okay. And uh, I'm not a big fan of comparing every cycle to the GFC, but um, HDS Waterworks was down in 07, 08, and 09, more than 50% peak to trough, and you know, that may have been tax rolls and an unstable muni market and things like that. But um, can you discuss the mix of the business and the overall economic environment today versus the predecessor company in that environment, which is clearly an unusual? Yeah, certainly. If we go back to the Great Recession and what happened back in that time frame, uh, our business was nearly 50% residential at that time. We focused a lot of our effort and resources on that. You know, since that time frame, one of the things that we were challenged with, it's about the time when, when Mark and I came on board to really try and reposition the business for long-term sustainable growth. And we built out um, a number of new uh, opportunities within municipal. We started aggressively going after smart meters, uh, going after other products to better serve that municipal um, uh, you know, sector, and you know now you're seeing a much different shift with the way our business is positioned uh, and how residential plays into it. So, you know, in addition, what I would say is back then as well too, we were also going through an integration of um, you know two different sizable uh, integrations of um, two players, National Waterworks and Hughes Supply uh, Waterworks. So there was a lot, there was some internal consolidation that was happening as well, which just lent itself to some of the challenges that we face. Now, what we have seen is we've really positioned ourselves in so many different ways from a product standpoint, from a market standpoint, from a sales standpoint, uh, to better drive a lot of the adoption in that. 
uh, of those and to continue that sustainable growth. Secondly, is even during that downturn, we generated an immense amount of cash that we were able to use to reinvest back in the business. And that's been one of the cornerstones of how we've, uh, you know, really endured through a lot of these different economic cycles is uh, between our ability to, um, you know, adjust our SG&A and adjust uh, our investments and how cash spins off when we, uh, you know, look at it some type of downturn. Does that help at all, David? It does. Yeah, that's very good. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, David. We'll take our next question from Anthony Pettinari of Citigroup. Anthony, please go ahead. Hi, this is Asher Sonnen on for Anthony. Um, I think you pointed to, to strong demand in residential, and but I think on your last call you talked about expecting demand from residential and markets to sort of decelerate from low double-digit growth to sort of mid-single-digit, high-single-digit growth in 2022. Is that still the case? Yeah, and Ashlyn, I... The way to think about it is we, we had really strong demand uh, last year, so especially as we got later uh, into the Q3 and Q4. So going up against those comps, I'd say we expected a, a lower growth rate uh, in terms of, uh, you know, residential demand, but uh, we're still seeing the strength there and a lot, lot development, just not at the, at the rate coming off of kind of double-digit uh, increases that we saw, saw last year. Great, thanks. And then just as a quick follow-up, you know, just on your comments around product availability, you know, with some of these projects, these municipal projects on hold as, as product availability remains tight, you know, is there a risk that the sort of IIJA funds don't even flow through meaningfully in, in 2023 if this sort of like product availability challenges, you know, persist uh, throughout the year? There's there's a chance, I guess, that could happen, but I would say given the demand that we've seen and the desire to, to be able to do a lot of these projects, um, I think you're going to see those funds start flowing through uh, in 23. I think it'll replace a lot of the self-funding that's happened with a lot of the municipals, a lot of the bond markets, uh, and the bond funding that has happened with, with some of the existing projects. So we anticipate it'll be utilized and that demand and momentum will continue into 23. Great, that's really helpful. I'll, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. And we'll take our next question today from Catherine Thompson of Thompson Research Group. Catherine, over to you. Hi, thank you for taking my questions today. I'm focusing on inflation uh, outlook and on inventory. Uh, first, how much of the uh, raised outlook is driven by volumes versus pricing? and putting some year-over-year uh, -year perspective on both of those metrics. Uh, and then the second on really more on the inventory side, given the shift from a just-in-time to just-in-case uh, strategy in a post-COVID world, how are you managing inventories going forward? Is some color on fill rates today um, versus year-ago period would be helpful. Uh, and why I bring this up is simply because even though inventories carry a greater value overall in a post-COVID world, we're starting to see some companies that are getting a little over their skis in terms of inventory. So any color in terms of how you plan on managing inventories effectively so you also don't get over your skis. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Catherine. It's Mark. I'll, I'll take the inflation question uh, first. On the uh, yeah, in terms of the raise on, on the guidance, you know, I would tell you most of that is is, is pricing. You know, we, like we said, we saw a lot of that accelerate and continue to accelerate uh, through Q1. Uh, so that top line raise, I'd say, is, is primarily pricing. Um, and in terms of you know the the full year uh, on that, I'd say it's a it's in kind of the mid teens that we expect. Uh, you know, and and that's. Uh, at a lower rate than what we had in the in the first quarter, obviously, as we continue to uh, anniversary some of those inflationary uh, you know metrics that we had in the in, in 2021. So we expect that that rate of acceleration would would uh, you know slow down uh, throughout 2022. Steve, you want to take the inventory? Sure. So Catherine, uh, you know you talked a little bit about just in time and just in case inventory. One of the things I'd share with you that we watch closely is. 
so much of our business is project based and so when we're looking at bringing in inventory uh, the majority of that inventory is essentially allocated to a specific project uh, for the most part. Uh, we do do some speculative buy and some uh, items that, you know, obviously would be stocked for ready to serve type inventory. Those tend to be very transferable across our network in different branches. So now it is something obviously uh, we watch and watch closely to make sure that our inventory doesn't get out of balance with what we're seeing both with our backlog and our uh, bidding activity. So we're very uh, conscientious of that. We, as you saw in the last several quarters, we've been able to invest in inventory and show a real strong return. And we predicate a lot of that based on being able to understand uh, what's coming at us in terms of uh, these projects that we're yet to fulfill that are in our backlog and what the bidding activity looks like in these end markets. So we do watch it closely. We're obviously very uh, aware of some of the challenges that particularly some of the retailers have gone through with um, you know, writing down inventory, et cetera. But all of our inventory is either uh, allocated or uh, fungible to other uh, other projects across our, our network to be able to, to be utilized along those lines. Okay, great, that's helpful. And then, it, in in terms of uh, what visibility you have for volumes, which is really more, um, let's say, backlogs, but the projects that are upcoming, what type of or what types of changes are you seeing in terms of type of projects? How has that changed today versus a year ago and even from the start of this year? Thank you. You know, um, from a year ago, I think probably the one area we're seeing uh, some continued growth in is certainly in non-residential construction and commercial construction. Uh, so we're seeing our fire protection product pull through been a lot stronger uh, as we started this year. Uh, you know, that was an area that was recovering after COVID and we're starting to see uh, some strength in that area, which has been encouraging. Uh, you know, residential and municipal have just been pretty steady and stable uh, for the most part at least, uh, from what we've seen compared to last year. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. We have our last question today from Andrew Obin of Bank of America. Andrew, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think uh, this is David Ridley laying on for Andrew Oben. Um, Mark, I just want to clarify something that you said earlier. Uh, so last year you got a 50 to 100 basis points uh, gross margin benefit from, you know, sell through a lower cost inventory. You know, is your expectation that that is uh, flat for this full fiscal year? Yeah, the, so the way I would think about that is that 50 to 100 basis points would be off of what our margin rate has been over the last, I'd say, three quarters, which has been in the kind of low 26% range. And when you apply that for the remainder of the year, you end up with gross margin rates that are about flat with 2021. Got it. And then the other question, have you seen – you know, absolutely hear you on the strength of the pipeline and so forth. Have you seen any indicator weakening, like maybe the time from, from bidding to, to project start or anything happening? Thank you. Yeah, no, th thanks for the question. You know, really, we have not seen any indicators at this point that there's any, any softness. And, uh, you know, we continue to talk to our suppliers, our customers, uh, look at all of our internal data uh, that, that we've seen, and, and really nothing at this point that, that points to uh, any kind of a slowdown in, in those those times. Thank you very much. Yep, thanks. Thank you, Andrew. That was our final question today, so I'd like to hand back to Steve for any closing remarks. Thank you all again for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you on and we hope you're doing well. We are extremely pleased with our first quarter performance and continue to focus on the controllable areas of our business. While there are many external factors that continue to impact the global economic backdrop, we remain confident in our ability to deliver strong results to our stakeholders in 2022 and beyond. We are committed to providing our customers with local knowledge, local experience, and local service nationwide. Thank you for your interest in Corin, Maine. Operator, that concludes our call.